So one of the great advantages of working with acrylic is that you do have the ability to sort of feel around your subject to find out where things are. Acrylic can be combined with oil painting. So you can underpaint in acrylic and overpaint with oil, but you can't do it the other way around. Acrylic, um, once it dries, remains fairly stable. Oil paint, when it dries, gradually shrinks in terms of its dimension. So if you paint oil under acrylic, literally the, the oil paint peels away from the acrylic painting on top and you end up with sort of slices almost a kind of skinning um, oil paint. Uh, other way around if you think about it you can buy an acrylic primer that you can use to prime your balls. So you can think about the fact that over painting oil on top of acrylic is a bit like priming your painting first of all um, but with a bit of preliminary work done, so a bit of drawing. Classically, uh, underpainting would have been done in things like tempera with oil painting as an underpainting technique. And again, the same advantage is tempera dries really quickly. So in a previous video, I talked about the idea of underpainting using black and white, and that's called a grisaille. Um, there are fundamentally three different kinds of underpainting. There's grisaille, Adaccio and Bista. So Bista is where you produce an underpainting in brown and here you're working with different transparencies of brown to create a variety of tones. Obviously grisaille which means grey is you're producing an underpainting in grey and that could be through different dilutions of black to give you different greys. That would work really well if you're working on a more transparent ground. Or you can mix with white and give you different tonalities of grey as I'm doing here. And Vodaccio is the addition of yellow ochre into the equation. So you're working with a palette of yellow ochre, black and white. And that works really well um, for figure studies. And in fact, if you look at Ewan Uglow's night paintings of the figure, uh, Uglow used that palette of black, yellow ochre and white. And for many years, I've had students make uh, collages using that palette. And it's a very effective palette. It produces a very wide expanse of colour. So I'm going to be producing this study today using a Vodaccio. Um, so at the moment I'm focusing on the cloud formations and I'm trying to establish really the tonal range of the image. And I need to fundamentally kind of block in as much as possible to start with the sort of big areas of tone. And I'm trying to do that initially with a big brush and I'm using a stiff hog hair type brush for that purpose. I personally find, and it is personal, that I tend to prefer working with hogs in acrylic and synthetics in oil. Some people work the other way around. It's entirely up to you what you want to do. Acrylic's great in that it dries so fast, so it does enable you to uh, establish areas, work back into things, correct your mistakes, etc. So once I've started to get a beginning sense of what's going on with the clouds, and again, as I've mentioned numerous times, half closing one's eye is really useful, uh, sort of squinting at the subject to try to help you see the range of tones in the subject. Trying to look across the tones as well. So I tend to mix up a tone and then think, where can I put that tone? Where is that tone also seen within the composition? And try not to be fooled by hue. In other words, the colour of something. So, you know, one can see a, a colour that you think is bright, but in fact within the painting it's actually a dark value. 
So in this instance as we go towards the horizon the uh, tonal differences between the uh, sky and the land are getting closer and closer and there's a sort of subtle transition between the base of the sky here as we go up into the space so I'm blending that as I go with water also allowing some of that to run I can do some more blending when I introduce my oil layers later on I'm looking at these edges particularly the edges of the sky and in feeling that that tonal relationship is stronger here so that's a darker value Now I've worked straight onto uh, an a, a MDF board with no preliminary priming. So what's going to be quite important is to make sure that before I start putting oil paint on top of this, I have covered up all the wood. So what I'm going to be doing, once I've established this drawing, is I'm going to be covering the whole board with a clear acrylic varnish just to give it uh, a seal to work against with my oil later on. And I'm going to be working with the oil paint in a kind of fairly transparent way, glazing into the study. So really the purpose of this grisaille is to give me the, the modelling of the volumes of the landscape, you know, to get a sense of that three-dimensionality of the clouds, etc. So as I said before, I think that it's very difficult to judge a tone in isolation. Only once you've started to establish other tones can you begin to work out exactly how dark a particular area is. And as I say, the great advantage of working with acrylic is that you can overlayer very, very quickly. So what I've got now is a slightly darker mass of cloud here going into there and that's slightly highlighted by the light catching the edge of a cloud here and here and I'm always thinking as well about how I use my brush how I angle my brush etc to make different kinds of mark marks that will approximate the kind of feel of the land and the feel of the cloud and that's a lot through experimentation testing one's materials out how thick or thin should the acrylic be what kind of brush should one use in order to make that kind of mark and that really can only be found through your own experimentation So now introducing some yellow ochre into the equation. It's going to make it much easier for me to start to differentiate between the land and the sky. In the uh, collage exercise that I did with students, I would often encourage students to uh, make a collage of the figure using combinations of white, black and yellow ochre. But I would then get them to place the um, 
uh, figure itself against the grey background and then that differentiation of, of, of temperature would create visual space. Here at the moment we're just really using that yellow ochre combined with either white, black or grey to give us different colorations. Generally speaking as we move spatially through the landscape the colors uh, in the foreground of the painting will be more saturated the nose in the background of the painting, they're closer to us, we're going to see greater visual contrast. And that's a kind of way of creating visual space. You don't have to use uh, yellow ochre to do this, although yellow ochre is quite a good colour, it's fairly widely available, it's fairly cheap, um, it's a good base colour, it yields a lot of Really exciting greens and you start to combine it with black and white. But yellow and black works quite nicely as well. And you know, by all means, just experiment, experiment, you know, experiment with different colour combinations, find out what works for you. It's also worth remembering that this palette, white, yellow, ochre and black, with the addition of cadmium red, becomes the Zorn palette, which is a classic limited colour palette that's used for figure painting. So if you look at the um, painter Anders Zorn, it's exactly the palette of colour that you see him, you see him using. So again the notion really is to establish the tonal masses, to establish some of the drawing. Not worrying so much about trying to match the colour. You know, that's going to come a bit later. I always advocate the idea that one should try to do as much as possible with the biggest brush possible. Before you then start working in with the smaller brushes. tend to hold my breath when I'm working on detail so if I'm puffing away that's going to explain the reason for that. And as again I think I said in a previous video, one's aspiration is not to try to copy exactly what you see but to get something which has got the feel of what you can see, it's got those sort of basic movements and rhythms of landscape.
think one also has to remember that, that when you're actually in the landscape itself, you don't take on everything. You skim across the landscape. You see small fragments of the landscape. So when you're working either plan air or, as in this instance, from photographic source material, don't try to meticulously paint everything that you can see. Instead, try to develop the notion of glancing over the image. And as you glance, what do you notice? What do you see? Another thing that's also you see quite a lot is an understanding of scale. And by that, what I mean is that this distance here is vast. It's a huge amount of actual real space. And yet visually it's occupying a tiny fragment of the painting. So it's important that you get a sense of the scale of the landscape that you're painting. And measurement can obviously be a really useful guide for that. So again, the notion of this study is going to be that I'm going to work it in a range of tones first, using my limited palette. And then this has been done in acrylic. And then when that's dry and I've sealed it, I'm then going to work back into it. I'll working with transparent glazes. Trying to then pull out the significant details. Obviously I do need to make sure this is dried properly for me to work back over the top of it. But as it's acrylic, that could be as little as 20 minutes, half an hour, depending on how much paint I've put down and what the drying conditions are today. So today is quite a bright sunny day and therefore my colour will dry fairly quickly 